Hola a todos, soy Javier Poveda y esto es De Bien TV, el canal donde te lo vas a pasar de bien mientras aprendes geografía, historia, historia del arte, economía y empresariales. Este vídeo va dirigido a mis alumnos de primero de la ESO sección, CEIP, Solencinar, Torrelodones. In this video we are going to study the unit 10, Ancient Greece. And since it's a very long unit, let's start. The sooner the better. So, Ancient Greece. Let's start. First, taking a look at the natural environment and the territory. Because the Greek civilization developed in three regions around the Aegean Sea. The European Greece, what is today the Republic of Greece in the south of the Balkan Peninsula, in Asia Minor, which is the western coast of the Anatolian Peninsula, today's Turkey, and the Greek islands, which, is, which are thousands and thousands of islands and archipelagos in the Aegean Sea. Greece, uh, mostly the European Greece, is a very mountainous country or region, and because of this it was difficult for agriculture to spread, and, well, the Greeks cultivated mainly cereals, barley and wheat, vines and olives. So, what, uh, um, if you remember when we studied the climates, this is a um, typical human landscape of the Mediterranean regions, because in Greece there is this Mediterranean climate. And since traveling overland was difficult because of this topography, the sea trade developed a lot. The Greeks were very, very good sailors. And this topography also contributed to the isolation and political divisions between Greeks. The Greek cities, or the, the Greeks organized in independent cities called polis, or polis in plural, or polis in singular. Each of these cities was a state itself. They maintained their independence and they controlled the surrounding territory. And uh, even though they were divided politically, all of the Greeks shared the same culture. They, feel, they felt they, that they were part of the same civilization. They shared the same language, the same religion. And altogether, this is considered to be the Helladic culture, la cultura heladica o helénica. And to recognize this, th themselves, the Greeks used the language because they called barbarians, barbaros, to the people who didn't speak Greek, the Greek language. So, for them, they were foreigners. Let's see this in the map. This is the, the Eastern Mediterranean. This is European Greece, okay? This is Asia Minor, the western coast of Asia Minor. Asia Minor is the peninsula, all the Anatolian Peninsula, and the Greek cities were uh, located here in the western part, and also in all of these cities in the Aegean Sea in all of these islands. And this is the Greek language, okay? This is a Greek inscription found in Delphi, where the greatest, the greatest sanctuary, Greek sanctuary was located, and this is an example of the Greek language. So, in the history of ancient Greece, we can recognize several periods depending on uh, many features. First, we have the Minoan civilization, then the Mycenaean civilization, then the Greek Dark Age, the Archaic Age, the most important, the Classical Age, and the Hellenistic Age. And we will see each of these ones uh, one by one. The first period is the Minoan civilization. It was the first Greek, uh, Greek uh, civilization that developed in um, this territory, particularly in the island of Crete, which is in the south of the Aegean Sea. This civilization had a, as its center a palace, which uh, there are many famous palaces. The most important one is the Knossos Palace, which is in the center of the Crete island. They were excellent potters, they were excellent sailors, they traded a lot of um, out of trades, and they bought metals. They prosperity came from the sea, so that is why his or their naval supremacy is called Thal Thalassocracy, or talas, well, la talasocracia, que es el gobierno de los mares. And this Minoan civilization went into decline around the year 1500 BC and eventually were invaded by the next civilization, which are the Mycenaeans. And this came from the mainland, Greece. 
let's see the map, this is Crete, and here in the middle it's Knossos. This is the Knossos Palace, a reconstruction, and this is the remains of it nowadays. As you can see, these columns are very, very famous, and we have also some paintings. A ver. Here, for example, the fresco of the dolphins inside the Palace of Knossos, the bull leaping, la taurocatapsia, or this, the throne, what, what it's called, the throne of Minos. And this, the Minoan civilization started to decline. Also, apart from the Mycenaean civilization, it is said that uh, it started to decline because of the vol of a volcanic eruption in the island of Tira, which is Santorini nowadays, which is a um, very famous tourist destination. The next civilization is the Mycenaean civilization, which started in the year 500 BC with the Achaeans, or Achaeos, the first Greek speakers who settled in European Greece and established the Mycenaean civilization in all this area colored in red. They were a warring population, they were warriors, they lived in fortified settlements with walls, surrounded by walls, because this didn't happen in the Minoan civilization, and the most important cities were Mycenae, Tyrins, and Pylos. The most important one is this Mycenae, which is Mycenas, bueno, que es Mycenas en castellano. And it, during this period is when the Trojan War is supposed to happen. This is Troy here in Asia Minor. Okay, this is Mycenae or Mycenae. I don't know how to say it. The reconstruction and these are the remains uh, nowadays. And this is a um, very famous uh, the entrance, the Lion Gate, La Puerta de los Leones and the mask of Agamemnon. Agamemnon was the king that appears in the Iliad, in the Trojan War, and the Dendra Panoply, the most important archaeological remains with the treasury of Atreus, these tumuls here. The next period is the Greek Dark Age so, uh, period, well, civilization, meh, which started uh, in around uh, 1200 BC when all the, um, the Mycenaean civilization was invaded by the Dorians who used iron weapons so they were more powerful and they migrated to this area. They occupied the Peloponnese Peninsula, Crete, and, and so this population had to settle on the coast of Asia Minor. And that is why we have Greek civilization in these areas. This is called Dark Age because we have very, very few information about this period, very few archaeological remains. Okay, this is, uh, well, some imaginary uh, depictions of the Dorian invasion, and after that comes the Archaic Age. In this, during this period, the polis started to develop, and the society evolved in four different social groups: the aristocrats, the rich families, they had the farmland, and they held political power. That is why the system is called oligarchy, the government of the few. Then we have the main body of population, the free people. Then we have foreigners and liberators. Liberated, liberated were the slaves who had obtained their freedom. They had limited rights. They didn't have political rights, and they could only work as traders or craftsmen. Finally, the slaves, the, so the lowest social class, they, the slaves were property of someone else, mainly property of the aristocrats, and you could become a slave because you didn't pay your debts, or because you were a prisoner of war, or because you were the son or the daughter of another slave. So your fathers were slaves. And during this period, colonization happened. Why this happened? The colonization is the foundation of new polis abroad, usually overseas. This happened because the population of the polis grew a lot and they didn't have enough food to feed everybody. So to avoid these problems, some inhabitants emigrated in search for a better life. They founded new polis overseas, very, very far away from mainland Greece, and these new cities were called colonies, while the origin city was called a metropolis and they traded between each other so the sea trade developed a lot and that is why the greeks were the first civilization to start using coins this colonization took place between this, the 8th and 6th centuries 
And where did they go? They go mainly to the Black Sea, to the coasts of the Black Sea, the Italian peninsula and Sicily, which is called the Magna Grecia, uh, the Big Greece, the North Africa and the Western Mediterranean, in, including the Iberian Peninsula, because we had Greek colonies here. This is a Greek um, boat sewed in the pottery. This is how they would look like. Um, even though this is a military ship, this is a trireme. The ancient coins, this is Electrum coins, which is an alloy of uh, gold and silver. And later, here we have silver Athenian drachmas. And this is uh, some example of colonies. This is Emporion, today's Ampurias in Gerona, which is in origin a Greek colony. Well, the Phoenicians, you don't have to study this, but the Phoenicians were another civilization who lived in the eastern coast of the Mediterranean with the cities of Tyre, Sidon and Byblos, for example. They traded a lot with the Greeks. They had a lot of influence in the Greeks because, for example, they gave them the alphabetic writing. Okay, That is why we can easily uh, read the Greek city. And they were also uh, colonizers and they had trading posts along all the, uh, throughout all the Mediterranean, mostly in the southern coast. So, as you can see here in this map, this is Greece and the light green areas are the uh, locations where the Greek colonies were settled, okay? And Magna Grecia, the coasts of the Black Sea and the Western Mediterranean. In blue you have the Phoenician colonies and here this is Phoenicia. So, now we enter the most important period of uh, Greek, uh, the Greek civilization, which is the Classical Age, which is, it is considered to be the golden age of Greek civilization and the most important polis were Athens and Sparta. So, in Athens, there were some abuses from the aristocracy and this caused the people to revolt. It's normal. So, tyrants came to power. A tyrant is a tyranno. They defended the interests of the people against the aristocracy, but in an authoritarian way, authoritarian way, okay? Like, uh, more or less, we can consider them like dictatorships. And at the end of the 6th century, the aristocracy finally <laughs> surrendered, entre comillas, and agreed to share their power with the free people. So now the free people had political rights, so they became citizens. They could intervene in the government of the police. But in exchange, they had to pay taxes and to serve in the army and the battle fleet. The Greek soldier is called hoplite. Okay, here you have. Some, a, a couple of examples of hoplites. And from this point, in Athens, a new political system was established in which every free people could participate in this government. And this is called the government of the people or the democracy. So, in this democracy, in this Athenian democracy, there were several important institutions. The most important ones are these ones. The assembly or ecclesia, the, you have to know these words. It was the gathering or the meeting of all the citizens where matters of interest were discussed. So when they have to take a decision, they gathered all the citizens in the polis. The, all the citizens are where the free men only the men, not the women, not the slaves, not the foreigners, only the male Athenians. And where well, the magistrates also were appointed, so women, metics, metics are the foreigners, it's the Greek word for foreigner, and the slaves were excluded from this ecclesia, they were not citizens. Then we have the Council of the 500, also called the Boule whose role was to draft the laws which had been debated in the assembly and to supervise the judges. Then we have the magistrates, which are the ones who ruled the city. They applied the decisions made by the assembly. We have three types of magistrates. The strategoi, which are the military leaders. The archontes, they govern the police. And the treasurers, who manage the tax collection. So, a strategoi, a strategoi for military matters, archontes for civil matters, and treasurers for money matters. And finally, for the um, judgments or the trials, we have the Supreme Court, also called Heliaia. They, and his function or its function was to deliver justice. 
So here you have a diagram. The ecclesia was the assembly of all the citizens. They voted the laws, the war, and one ostracism, which was the exiles. And they elected the magistrates, strategists, archons, and treasurers. And by lottery, some citizens were chosen to form part or to participate in the heliaia, the courts, and the boule, the council of the 500. And they meet. They met here in this part of Athens, the Nix Hill. Okay, this is where the ecclesia gathered, and the um, the people who were who had to speak, they went here in the bema, which is a podium for the orator. And this is how it would look like at this time. And here, this is a meeting of the ecclesia, and this is a clepsidra, which is um, a clock to measure the speaking time of each one of the orators. Then this is the, the Boule, uh, usually gathered in the Boleuterion. This is a Boleuterion of Priene, some kind of assembly. And to choose the people who had to um, made, uh, who had to be part of the Boule and the Hegeliaia, they used this machine, which is called the Cleroterion. This is a lottery machine, okay? And... Uh, what? I don't know what is, is this. Well... And this is a uh, clerotina with the pinacia, these small uh, pieces of bronze. And this is a video uh, of about how the demo democracy in Athens work. No, I don't want to watch it. No, no. Okay, now Sparta. In Sparta, the political system was slightly different from Athens. It was an oligarchy, the government of the few. And the most important institutions were the two kings. It was a diarchy. They had, they were, they had the military power. They had two kings, five ephors, those ephors, who maintained security and monitored the kings and the assembly or appella. It was the meeting of the citizens of Sparta. Who were the citizens? The free people. But they weren't citizens. The periechi, los periecos, que son los... Um, uh, the free men who had no political rights, women, slaves, the helots or los ilotas, and the foreigners. And finally, they had a 28 elders called the gerusia. They proposed actions to the appella to be approved. Here you have um, a Spartan hoplite. These are the efforts. This is Philippides, the runner who went to ask for help against the Persians. And this is the gerusia, these guys here uh, in front of the effort the efforts. The most important war conflicts were the Greco-Persian Wars and the Peloponnese War. First, the Greco-Persian Wars, they were three, but we are only going to study two, the first two. They were wars between the Greeks and the Persians. And the, per the Greeks called the Persians the Medes, los Medos, por eso en castellano se llaman las guerras médicas. The Persians tried to take control of Greece, so all or most of the polis, of the ancient Greek polis, had to make, to make pardon, an alliance. And this alliance was led by Athens and Sparta. The Greco-Persian Wars lasted since 499 to 479 BC. In the first Greco-Persian War, the Persians landed in the plain of Marathon, the Persian king Darius, and he tried to conquer Athens, but he was defeated in the Battle of Marathon in the year 490 BC. In the second one, the new king Xerxes, Xerxes fought against Greece again, but this time he went, um, he traveled by land and invaded Greece with a huge army in the year 480 BC. He defeated the Greeks, led by Leonidas I in the Battle of Thermopylae, but later he was defeated twice, first in a naval battle in Salamis in the same year, and later in a land battle, Plataea, the following year, 479. So these are the, these are the routes. The first Greco-Persian War, here in green, this is Marathon, and later the second Greco-Persian War, they went both by land and sea, but mainly by land. Here they defeated the Greeks in the Thermopylae, later they sacked Athens, and finally they were defeated here in Salamis and in Plataea. This is a, a picture of the Battle of Marathon with all the hoplites here. And, well, another picture with the Persians here with these funny shields. 
a reenactment of the Battle of Marathon. Marathon was next to the beach, and after the Greek victory, uh, the runner Philippides announced he, he supposed allegedly went uh, well ran from the battle from Marathon to Athens, the 42 kilometers, to announce the victory. And when he told that to the city, he died of exhaustion. And this is the Battle of the Thermopylae with Leon Leonidas here. And what is going on here? I don't know why the slides are repeating. Well, one of the best movies of this period is 300, 300. If you want to watch the video again, here you have some fragments of this. This is a picture of the Battle of Salamis with these triremes um, ramming the Persian the Persian, I will see that, triremes or ships, naval ships, the Greeks won, and in Plataea also the Greeks won. Then the other great war was the Peloponnesian War, because after the Second, the second Greco-Persian War, the Greek polis were divided into main political uh, alliances, which were called leagues. The Delos League, led by Athens, and the Peloponnesian League, led by Sparta. They both leagues fought each other in the Peloponnesian Wars between 431 and 404 BC. Athens was defeated and Sparta won, but they were all very weakened. They were, after th almost 30 years of war, they were very exhausted, so they never recovered and the Macedonians will take advantage of this situation. Well, this is Pericles, the leader of Athens, and here in red you have the territory of the Peloponnesian League and in blue the territory of the Delos League led by Athens. Here, well, the Battle of Sphacteria is the only time that, well, or in history where the Spartans surrendered. And how was life in the polis? Well, you just only need to know that the polis had several parts. All the polis had a wall surrounding them. Okay, here you have them. Then they had two main parts in the inside, a higher part, which was also walled, the Acropolis, in which the main temples were located. The rest of the polis was, or the low area, was the main part, it was of course also wall, and all the houses were located here, and the most important part was the agora here, which was a central square in which the market was celebrated. Around the city, in the surrounding territory, you, they had the farmland which they cultivated. This is the agora, the agora of Athens in a market day, okay? This big square with all these uh, little shops, or I don't know how to call this. And here the Acropolis. This is how ancient, ancient Athens looked like. This is a picture from the video game Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And another picture, as you can see, a wall the low low area, the high area or Acropolis, okay, and the surrounding land. The last part is the Hellenistic period, the Hellenization, and this is this happened when the Macedonians intervened in Greece. Since the Greek polis were so weakened after the Peloponnesian War, the Kingdom of Macedonia took advantage of this situation and controlled Greece. They invaded and defeated the Greek polis, so the Greek polis were part of the Macedonian Kingdom. This happened during the Kingdom or the rule of Philip II, Filippo II, not Felipe. And Philip II was assassinated and his son succeeded him. His son was Alexander the Great, Alejandro Magno, mejor general de la historia. He was 22 years old and he led um, the military campaign, which was the dream of his father, against the Persians. And it lasted 10 years, since 334 to 324 BC. They or he defeated several times the Persians in the Granicus, Isus, and the most important one, and the one you need to know, Gaugamela, which is in Mesopotamia, and he gained control of most of the Persian territory. We will see the map with his route. Darius III, which was the Persian king, was assassinated, and Alexander took control of the rest of the Persian Empire, and he even reached India. 
But when he was there, his army was so exhausted that he forced the army forced Alexander to retreat and go back. He went back to Babylon in Mesopotamia and he died the year after in 323 BC. Why the Macedonians managed to defeat the Persians? Because this, he, they used this fantastic military formation, which is called a syntagma, and many syntagma it uh, forms the Macedonian phalanx. Okay, with these soldiers with with these very 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 long spears, which were called sarisas, and this is how the formation would look like the phalanx formation in battle. Okay, this is the route. Starting from Pela, the Macedonian capital, he went into the territory of the Persians, defeated the Mingranicus, and he went here in Issus again, then Phoenicia, and in Egypt, they, he founded Alexandria, and later he entered Mesopotamia and defeated, in, defeated the Persians in Gaugamela, and later the eastern territories were conquered, Darius III was assassinated, and he reached here the India, this is the Battle of Hiraspes against the Rey Porus, and here in this part, in this location, the army forced him to retreat and to go back to Babylon where he died. Okay, this is a picture of the Battle of the Granicus. Alexander commanded personally the Macedonian cavalry. This is Alexander cutting the Gordian knot. This is the Gordian knot. It was said that the one who managed to cut the Gordian knot will rule over the, go the world. And Alexander cut it with the the spear well not the one who would cut the gordian knot the one who would untie the gordian knot but alexander said bah, i cut it this is the alexander mosaic in the battle of isu this is alexander and this is darius the third this is the siege of tyre which is a phoenician uh, city it was an island and alexander built this ramp over the sea to reach the city this is alexandria of egypt with the pharos Okay, the island in the island of Pharos. This is the Battle of Gaugamela with the Phalanx formation here. And if you want, you have here two videos depicting this, this fantastic battle from the movie Alexander. I don't want to watch it. No, I don't want to watch it. Later, the Battle of Hiraspes against the King Porus of India. He had to fight the elephants. Again, if you want to see that, you have these two scenes from that movie. Ah! Oh, ah! Oh. Ahora. And finally, when Alexander died, his generals fought each other for the control of the empire and they finally formed each one his own kingdom. These kingdoms are known as the Hellenistic kingdoms. The most important one were the, the kingdom of Antigonus, the Seleucid Empire by Seleucus, and the e Egypt uh, kingdom by Ptolemy, the Ptolemaic Egypt. In this territories there was a mixture between both the um, the greek culture and the um, and the own culture of the people living there and this is called hellenism el hellenismo and these hellenistic kingdoms lasted for 200 years more until they were conquered one by one by the romans the last one was the egyptian kingdom the ptolemaic egypt and the last uh, Egyptian queen was Cleopatra. And he died, she died in the year 30 B BC. Here you have the kingdom of Seleucus, of Seleucus, the kingdom of Antigonus, and the kingdom of Ptolemy. Okay? There were more of these Diadocus or these generals, but with these three big ones is enough for us. And now the Greek culture. The Greeks, first, we have to talk about religion. The Greeks were polytheists, that this means they believed in many gods that had human form and lived on the top of the Mount Olympus. They had, well, virtues and defects like human, they behaved like humans and they used their power how they wanted and all of the tales uh, that, that tell us about all the gods' lives and the heroes are called altogether mythology. And also, the Greeks had uh, or believed in the prediction of future or the will of the gods, and this was done in the oracles, los oraculos, who were or which were sacred places where the gods spoke through seers, 
videntes. And the most famous one was the Oracle of Delphi, el oráculo de Delfos, dedicado a Apolo. These are mm, in the main gods of the Greek religion. There are a lot more, but these are the most important. The king of the gods was Zeus, and also Poseidon, who ruled the sea, and Hades, who ruled the underworld. This is the Mount Olympus, as you can see there is no god here, and this is the temple of Apollo in Delphi. The, uh, the oracle of Delphi was here, okay, and this is how it would look like in that time. In literature, the Greeks wrote a lot, they liked epic poetry, for example, the Iliad and the Odyssey, who tells us about the Trojan War and the travel, uh, the travel of Ulysses back home in Ithaca, and um, all both write, uh, wrote by Homer, and also we have the heroes who are mythological beings, this, they are sons of a god and a mortal or a human. The most famous one are Theseus, Perseus, Heracles and Achilles. Uh, and here you have some of these myths, the Zeus defeating the Minotaur, Perseus with the head of Medusa, who transformed in stone everyone who looked at her, the Achilles who died in the Trojan War because of an arrow on the back of his feet, and Heracles who was the strongest man in the world, and he had to perform these 12 labors, okay, and you, can, you have them all here. In the Iliad, the Homer tells us about the Trojan War with the Trojan horse. Here, this is part of the movie, if you want to see the movie Troy with Brad Pitt, que guapo es. And um, this is the, Odyssey, the um, chapter of Odysseus and Sirens in the Odyssey. The Sirens tried to murder the sailor, so he was tied to this stick here in the ship, so he could hear the chant of the Sirens without being killed. Also, in philosophy, philosophy was born in Greece. You will study philosophy later in the fourth course and in Bachillerato. And the Greek thinkers were the first one to use logical reasoning, which is very, very, very important because it allows us to explain rationally the world. And they didn't believe that many of the, the natural world, um, the phenomena could be, they believe that this phenomena could be explained by reasoning, reasoning rather than base it, basing it in re, um, religious beliefs. The most important philosophers were Socrates, Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle was the teacher of Alexander, by the way. Alexander the Great. This is Socrates who committed suicide by drinking this poison. And also in Greek culture, they had a lot of advances in science, in mathematics with Pythagoras and Eratosthenes, this is the Pythagoras theorem, in geometry with Euclides, physics with Archimedes, medicine with Hippocrates, and astronomy with Aristarchus of Samos. For example, the Pythagoras theorem, the mm, greatest common divisor by Euclides, Eratosthenes could measure the circumference of the world of the earth in the year 240 BC, so more than 2000 years ago, they already knew about this, and this is a fantastic video by Carl Sagan, and Archimedes invented many things, this is the Archimedes screw, and uh, Aristarchus of Samos, he presented the first known heliocentric model. A heliocentric model is an astronomic model in which the sun is at the center of the universe and the planets orbit around it. Okay, the sun, the earth, and the moon. And also, uh, regarding the culture, the Greeks celebrated every year the Olympian Olympic Games, who were held in the polis of in the polis of Olympia, which is in the Peloponnese. In which um, um, several uh, sports tu sports tournaments were held, for example, running or pancreation, which is some kind of fight, long jump, discus throw, and many others. Finally, the last part is the Greek art. In the Greek art, the Greeks always aimed for beauty. They liked beautiful things, but the idea, the idea of beauty for the Greeks was based on the balance and harmony, el equilibrio y la armonía, balance and harmony in a mathematical way, 
this their artistic creation were focused on the human form and used specific proportions, the perfect proportions for the human body and for their buildings, Sp uh, specific math mathematical proportions. So, first the architecture. In Greek architecture, we have the predominance of the straight line. No veréis una curva jamás. The arches were not used because they were curved and the buildings were covered with a flat roof, okay, like this one. And this flat roof is called lintel, un dintel. We have seen that in Egypt, remember. The most important buildings were tem temples and theaters. In the temple was considered is the house of the god and only the priests could enter them and the religious ceremonies were held outside. They all had rectangular floor plans, so if you see this temple from the top, the shape it has is a rectangle, except for some, some ones, a few ones, who were circular. The circular templars are called tholoi, plural, tholos, singular. They were built on top of, of a stepped platforms. A stepped platform, they had columns around it, which is called the peristyle, and late, um, at the top of the columns, there was a lintel, a horizontal structure called entablature, un entablamento. And finally, the building was covered with a sloped roof, un tejado con pendiente, with a triangular pediment at each end, que se llama frontón. Pediment es el frontón. And they were made of stone and marble. So... Well, this is a marble quarry in Carrara, famoso marble de Carrara, precioso para cocina. And these are the theaters. In the theaters, they had dramatic representations, and the theaters have three parts. The skenae here, the orchestra, this circular shape in the middle where the musicians were placed, and finally, the cavea where the crowd was seated the theater of Dodona, the theater of Epidaurus, and they built these theaters in the sloped mountain, okay? So that they take advantage of the relief and they build, in, they build them here, okay? Again, the cavea, the orchestra, and the skenae. O skenae, da igual. This is a tholos, a circular shaped temple in Delphi. A ver... And these are the parts of a Greek temple. This is very important. We have the stepped platform here at the bottom. Then, okay, this is from the side. This is a top view. We have the stepped platform here. We have the columns, okay? And all these columns are called the peristyle, okay? The building was surrounded by columns. We have the entablature, okay, with, with the lintel, the frieze, and the cornice. The entablature. And finally, at the end, the pediment, okay? And also, in the inside, in the Greek temples, this is important that you have to notice, the temples had three rooms. They had the naos, in which the, the statue of the god or the goddess was located. The Pronaos at the entrance, the entrance was called Pronaos, the main room was called Naos with the statue of the god, and the Opistodomos was the room in which the treasure of the temple was placed. And the Greeks built in different ways, and these ways are called architectural orders or architectural styles. The three styles of the Greek art are the following, Doric, Ionic, and Corinthian, Dorico, Jonico, y Corintio. And you have to know the three of them. You have to know how to recognize the three of them. How to do that in the easiest way? You have to look at the capital of the columns. The capital is the, the upper part of the columns. And in every uh, architectural, in each, I mean, architectural order, the capital is different. You have this simple capital with this rectangular and then this circular piece, okay, in the Doric uh, order. This is the most simple. As you can see here, this is Doric, Doric order. Then in the Ionic order, we have these uh, spirals, okay, 
which are called volutes, las volutas. This here, this is ionic. Okay? Cuando ves espirales es jónico. And finally, in the Corinthian, you have a capital with acanthus leaves, con hojas de acanto, as you can see in this one. Okay? So it's very easy to recognize them. So, the Parthenon of Athens, probably, well, for sure, the most famous Greek temple. Step platform here, the peristyle, all of these columns the entablature here and the pediment which is half destroyed okay and this temple is doric okay o dorian como lo, como lo llamamos doric dorian es lo mismo is doric okay because look at the capital this very simple capital this is called a doric temple more examples Hephaestus in Athens also doric poseidon in paestum which is in italy doric Era in Paestum Doric as well. Athena Nike in the Acropolis of Athens. This one is Ionic. Look at these spirals. Ionic. This is the Erecteion in Athens with the famous porch of the Caryatids. And this temple is Ionic. Or Ionian, no sé cómo lo llama. Ionian, Ionic es lo mismo. <coughs> the Nereid Monument in Santos. Ionic or Ionian look at the architrave and this pediment which uh, is complete. The temple of Olympian Zeus in Athens, Corinthian. Look at the acanthus leaves in the capitals. In the Greek sculpture, the main subject, the main um, depiction they made of in sculptures were or was the human form. They had human sculptures, most of them. And the most commonly used materials were wood, limestone, but mostly marble and bronze. And we can distinguish three periods in Greek sculpture, the Archaic Age, the Classical Age, and the Hellenistic Age. Three styles within the Greek sculpture. In the Archaic period, which is very similar to the Egyptian art, the figures were rigid, the, their faces had big eyes and they had a forced smile. And these are called Kouros and Korai. Kouros, the men, which were naked, and Korai, the women, which were dressed. Then we have the most famous one, the classical period. And here they finally found their uh, idealized beauty through perfect proportion. This perfect proportion is called the canon. The most important canon was the Polycleto's canon, el canon de Polycleto. And uh, according to this, the body should be seven times the size of the head. So if my head is this long, then the rest of the body will have to be six times more long. Okay? They usually depicted the gods and athletes. And we have very famous sculptures like Miron, Phidias, Lysippos, Copas and Praxiteles apart from Polycleto's. Finally, in the Hellenistic period, the sculptures became way more expressive with much more movement. Okay, and sometimes in these uh, sharply turnings and very, uh, they were suffering, you will see that. So, in the archaic period, these rigid uh, sculptures, these sakuros, these are korai, and, or kore, kore singular, korai uh, plural. Okay, Lady of Hauser, La Core del Peplo, Peplos Core, and the Kouros of Anabisos. As you can see, big eyes, the archaic smile, and they were naked and very rigid. In the classical period, here they find the perfect proportion. This is, uh, these are very famous, the Discobulus of Miron, the Doriforos of Polycletus, and Hermes and Dionysus of Praxiteles. As you can see here, they finally made the perfect proportion you can see i don't know if i have seen so you the canon well it's okay about the apoxiomenos of lisipo no let's go back here in the doriforos of polycletos the length of this head from the chin to the top of the head well the length of all the body is seven times the head if you take this distance okay more or less this one two three three here, 
4, 5, 6, 7. Okay, the length of the body from the feet to the top of the head x is seven times exactly, seven times the size of the head. Okay, more uh, sculptures, the Poxiomeno, Poxiomenos of Lysippos, the photos by Scopas and the Athenea Parthenos. This is a reconstruction, okay, because this uh, we don't have any remain of this. This was more. Uh, uh, well, I don't know what I'm saying. This is the Athena Parthenos in Ophidias, which was inside the Athenian Parthenon. And finally, in the Hellenistic period, we have movement. Okay, they, they have these shapes, these turnings, these movements, these extreme positions. This is La Venus de Milo, the wind's victory of Samothrace, La Victoria Lada de Samothracia, La Venus de Lely. And as you can see here, the suffering and this turning, sharp turnings and this violence and this movement, and this suffering. I have said suffering twice, I don't know. This is Laocon and his sons, Laoconte y sus hijos. And this is the Farnis Bull El Toro Farnesio, el grupo El Toro Farnesio que lo están aquí domando. Fijos en la violencia y el movimiento. Okay, and finally, in the Greek painting and pottery. We have very few examples of Greek painting, but we have found a lot of them in the pottery. The pottery was decorated well or, or, or with geometric patterns and vegetables like this, okay? This, uh, lo que nosotros llamamos cenefas, vale? Like this, these geometric patterns, and later with three types black figures on a red background, red figures on a black background, and finally various colors on a white background. So, black figures, red figures, and white background. This is red figure pottery. As you can see, the figures are red and the background is black. Here you have black figure, figure pet pottery painting, which is the opposite. We have um, red uh, background and black figures. Finally, we have, this is more rare, the white ground pottery painting with several colors with a white background. And this is the end. This is an epitaph, which is um, a poem for the dead, in the Thermopylae, and it was written by Simonides of Chaos in remembrance of the Spartans who died in the battle against the Persians, remembered in Thermopylae, 480 BC. I'm going to try to read this. Oxein angelein lacerimoniois, hoti tei de queimetha, tois keinon remasi peithomenoi. O stranger, tell the Lacedemonians that will I hear obedient to their words. This is very, very beautiful, extremely beautiful. And that's it. So, Uh, se va. And that's it for this unit. Porque sigo hablando en inglés. Esto es todo por esta unidad de la antigua Grecia. Me ha salido un vídeo bastante largo, pero es que este tema es muy tocho. Pero luego no es para tanto, ¿eh? Que no me, no me vengáis con cositas. Bueno, el caso. Eh, cualquier cosa, cualquier duda que os surja, sabéis que estoy a vuestra disposición por mis canales habituales, aula virtual, correo electrónico, incluso por el Twitch y por el. Se me acaba de ir el nombre de la red social de las fotos. ¿Cómo se llama? Espérate. Instagram, se me ha ido. Y por el Instagram. Este es el penúltimo tema, ya estamos llegando casi al final. Y si te has visto los 48 minutazos, casi 49, que está durando este vídeo, que sepas que eres mi héroe y tienes un positivo. Muchas gracias por verlo y nos vemos en el próximo con los romanos.